Oh, hi. Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company. Welcome to Off the Clock, a weekly series where I get to interview Clock alums. Off the Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Hope Lincoln Baker. This week, I got to catch up with Marissa Gonzalez, who works for Wicked on Broadway. Let's hear what she had to say. Good evening. My name is Dr. Todd Florin. I am one of the principal conductors and music directors at College Light Opera Company in Falmouth, Massachusetts. I am also an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Emergency Medicine at Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm very excited to be presenting tonight's On the Clock on COVID-19 in musical theater, The Way Forward. Just a little disclaimer before we get started. This talk expresses my own synthesis and opinions on both the medical and the musical literature with regard to COVID-19. It does not reflect the opinions of my employers and does not reflect official recommendations of any organization. I'm simply here to share my interpretation of the science behind COVID-19 and how that science uh, impacts our way forward when we think about musical theater. Evidence is emerging and changing on a daily basis with regard to COVID-19, so parts of this talk may be obsolete next month. This is new for all of us, and we've learned so much over the last several months uh, in the midst of this pandemic, but we're learning new things every day, and therefore things can change very rapidly, as you know. I think that any talk about COVID-19 and, and musical theater needs to start with some background about the disease and um, about the public health measures that can battle this disease. So this is an image of, of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes the disease state of COVID-19. And what you can see is that it's a fairly simple structure. It's about 0.1 micron in diameter, and it, it consists of a single strand of RNA in its core, a lipid bilayer, so, so a dual layer of fats that form its cell membrane, and then four proteins. And the spike glycoprotein, or the S protein, is what gives coronavirus its name. They look like crowns on the outside of the um, lipid cell wall, and they are responsible, we think, largely for the binding of coronavirus to the respiratory mucosa of individuals it infects. As we now know by now, coronavirus uh, is transmitted largely through respiratory droplets and likely through respiratory aerosols as well. That is the major form of transmission. Although transmission may be possible by touching doorknobs or other objects that may have coronavirus on them and then touching one's face, the major mode of transmission is through respiratory droplets and aerosols, which are spread through talking, singing, sneezing, coughing, anything that, that puts your, the aerosols from inside your respiratory tract out to the environment can spread SARS-CoV-2 to another individual. Therefore, the CDC and other expert organizations recommend these fundamental yet basic means to limit the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Things like covering your coughs and sneezes, washing your hands often, and this can be a simple soap and water for 20 seconds because we know that soap actually breaks up that lipid bilayer cell membrane and renders coronavirus inactive. Cleaning and disinfecting with appropriate solutions, avoiding close contact, and as, as we all know by now, six feet is considered as of now the standard distance to stay uh, physically apart in order to minimize the spread of droplets and aerosols that may contain SARS-CoV-2. Masking, covering your mouth and nose with a mask when you're around others is now a proven means of preventing the spread of SARS-CoV-2. And it's probably one of the strongest things that we have in our arsenal is, is, is wearing a mask over our nose and our mouth. And then monitoring our health daily. This pandemic is the ultimate, um, the ultimate test of uh, community in that we have to take care of each other, which means that when we are showing signs of symptoms, we need to be able to quarantine ourselves and not put ourselves 
in close proximity with others so as to put them at risk for potentially contracting SARS-CoV-2. So let's talk about a little bit about how these viruses spread. So as you can see in this diagram, we see something called the R value. And what the R value is, is how many people on average a single infected person infects. So on the left-hand side of our screen, we see an R value of one, an R zero of one, which means that if this person is, is infected, they will cause one secondary infection, and that person will then cause one secondary infection, and then that person will cause one secondary infection. The R0 of, of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is anywhere between 1.9 and 3.2, so approximately 2.5, which means that every person infected with SARS-CoV-2 will ultimately infect two or three other individuals over the course of their infection. And as you can see from this diagram, which is an R0 of four, it takes four iterations to massively spread this infection from one individual. And this is why SARS-CoV-2 is so um, widespread, because it is easy to spread and that spread becomes exponential based off of that R0 number. So one of the ways that we will talk about later in this talk that we can identify and stop the spread is through what's called contact tracing. So contact tracing aims to identify and alert people who have come into contact with a person infected with coronavirus. So here is our single infected individual. They see four people. They infect two of them, right? So our R0 is 2.5 between two and three. And then similarly, that individual infects two people. That individual can infect one and so on and so forth. What contact tracing tries to do is to isolate the source at the earliest possible time that it is known that, a, that an individual is infected and then trace back all of that individual's contacts to be able to let those people know to quarantine, to mask, to be aware of symptoms, to consider testing, so as to then not allow the spread of SARS-CoV-2 to get beyond this layer right here. So one of the ways that people have been talking about um, advancing the technology for contact tracing is using smartphones. That's just one way to that has been suggested for an efficient, effective means of being able to trace potentially infected people. Now, contact tracing is one of the things that we're going to be talking about later when it comes to the theater, both for cast and crew members and also for audiences. So let's dive into, now that we've gone through that basic background, let's dive into COVID-19 in musical theater. And so much has been said about the audiences. When are people going to be able to congregate as an audience? And I think I'd like to flip that paradigm around a little bit and start with thinking about the actors. Theater cannot exist without the actors, without the crews, without the orchestra. And so I think we should start there. And then we can talk about the implications for our audiences. So here are some basic considerations for the actor. Theater, musical theater, requires us to be in close proximity with one another. There are many risky behaviors that exist in musical theater as we knew it in the pre-COVID-19 era. Actors are close to each other. They are singing, which is putting more respiratory droplets out into the, into the air. There's large groups of actors in a confined space. Ventilation in the theaters can be limited. Backstage areas can be crowded. The theater is, is a high risk place when you're talking about a highly transmissible respiratory virus for which there is not significant substantial herd immunity. And so for any in-person theater to occur, here are several things that we need to consider. The first is we must have rapid ability to test, trace, and quarantine. So if an actor were to develop symptoms, theaters need to be, theater companies need to be able to rapidly get testing for that individual. And upon return of a positive test, 
trace all of the other individuals that that individual was in contact with and get all of them into quarantine. This is the only way that we are going to be able to ultimately have a safe community with, within the theater. Considerations for staging. It may be that in the heart of the pandemic, that physical distance is going to have to be considered uh, when directors are staging pieces. Masking. Now, this is not possible in many situations to have actors wearing masks while they're performing. It may require us to sp suspend our disbelief a little bit, but masking is a very hard thing to do uh, in the setting of theater where you are trying to convey stories in as realistic a uh, form as possible. Distancing is also not possible in many situations, um, particularly scenes where there's intimacy involved and um, it really is not possible to do a scene with, that, with appropriate physical distancing. So the way that, that the art is put together in terms of staging, in terms of costuming, needs to consider the virus to begin with. Um, things like sanitizing, sanitizing hands, sanitizing rehearsal spaces, audition spaces, performance spaces, scene shots, costume shots. So sanitizing not only in terms of your own hands, but sanitizing high touch surfaces. And that has to occur frequently throughout the day, at the beginning, at the start of a work day, and also at the end of a work day. Ventilation. Oftentimes theaters and rehearsal rooms are not the most well ventilated um, spaces. That will, there, that will allow droplets and aerosols to remain in the air if there's not proper air exchange. And so shortened rehearsal periods with breaks to allow for airflow exchange in the rehearsal room is another consideration for how to keep our actors safe uh, in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic times. And then outdoors, if possible. We know that heat and being outdoors decreases the transmissibility of the virus. And so if there are options for outdoor performance spaces, um, that is another consideration. Now, the reality is, is when we look at this list, many of these things are not possible. And certainly, it is not going to be possible in the short term for theater to emerge exactly the way it was before the pandemic. I think that is really an impossibility. And I think that many would say that for the sake of the actor's safety, in addition to crews and musicians and audience, that having some degree of herd immunity, meaning that 60 to 70% of the population are immune, either by being infected and having antibodies or by being properly vaccinated, and until that time, large scale theater, the way that we knew it, is likely not going to be possible because it's very difficult to adhere to um, all of these safety public health considerations. So this by now is, is a fairly famous case report of the Skadja Valley Chorale where 61 singers um, got into a room they didn't touch each other, they didn't share food, but they um, did rehearse. And of those, a very high number in the 50s were infected and two died. And this, um, this raised a lot of eyebrows to think about when is it going to be possible to sing together in closed spaces given the rapid transmissibility of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So when we breathe, we exhale about 20 to 50 viral particles per minute. And these um, estimates are based off of influenza, which we're going to sort of extract to um, SARS-CoV-2. When we speak, we believe that we, can, that we are exhaling 200 to 1,000 viral particles per minute and more with louder speaking, and they last longer in confined spaces. So if you're in a confined space, and you're speaking regularly, those viral particles may be suspended in air up to eight minutes uh, in duration. And sneezing, a high force exhalation of respiratory droplets can lead to up to two million viral particles being extruded into the air. So I suppose the question is, 
how many viral particles actually cause infection? And the answer is we don't know yet. The people have estimated that at a minimum, about a thousand viral particles may be enough to induce infection. It may be more. Uh, and that depends on a lot of things. It depends on the space, the temperature, the airflow. It depends on the host. So if, if different people have different immune responses and some people may be more immune to SARS-CoV-2 and therefore need a higher viral load to be infected than say another individual. So we just don't know. What we do know is that the likelihood of infection is generally equal to the amount of exposure times the time of exposure. So those are the two things that we think about when we think about how likely an individual is to be infected, how much exposure they have, and how long they're exposed. And that's where all these public health measures um, come into play. So this was a study uh, done in Europe that looked at airflow from singers. And what you can see is that this is a soprano who's actively singing. And you can see that up to about three to four feet in front of her, she has a cloud of her um, respiratory aerosols that, that is present with her singing. And because of this, this is why we must stress physical distancing. If you are within the, those three to four feet of this um, aerosol cloud, that puts you at substantially higher risk of then inhaling SARS-CoV-2 and becoming infected yourself. So this video is called the Schlieren test. And this is a video um, that was put out by the National Federation of High Schools that, are, that have performed um, fairly extensive studies looking at aerosols for different types of musicians, singers, um, instrumentalists. And what this test shows you is how much airflow is coming out during active singing. And so let me see if I can hit play here. So you can see that right around her mouth and her nose, we're having active exhalation of aerosols. This test also picks up her own body heat, which is why we see something up here. So you've really got to look here to see how much aerosols there is. Now, let's look at what happens when she puts a mask on. Her body heat is still coming from here. There is a little bit coming from the top of the mask, but there's very little coming from the front of the mask. It doesn't get rid of it completely, but it stops transmission much better than without the mask. So this same group looked at particle concentration in aerosols or APS using different actors and musicians doing different tasks. And what you can see is this is an actor performing a monologue without a mask. And the concentration that, the, that is the total concentration that is coming out during that monologue is as high as one per centimeter cubed. Um, now, what you can appreciate is the minute you put a mask on, there is an 80% decrease in the amount of aerosols that, that are put out into the air um, by this actor performing the monologue. And when they're reading regularly, you can see that it is, it is even lower and background is not speaking at all. So this really shows us that putting on the mask de substantially decreases the amount of aerosols that are put out in the air from basic speaking. This, this same group also looked at a soprano singing. And what you can see is for scales and warming up, here's your, your aerosol concentration. But for singing either hymns or pop songs, the concentrations go way up, higher than even an actor performing a monologue um, using standard speaking voice on the stage. Now, you put a mask on or a screen covered in pantyhose to sort of um, mask the, the, the mouth and the nose, and you can see that there really is very little difference between 
singing with a mask and just sitting and breathing. Again, this is the efficacy of a mask. I want you to keep in mind that all of this data has not yet been peer reviewed. Uh, this group put this out uh, into the public just to, to get the information out there, but I think that further studies are going to need to be done to confirm this before we act on it. The COVID Theater Think Tank is a group of theater professionals and public health professionals that have come together to discuss guidance in thinking through how we can move forward with theater in the COVID-19 era. And I give you their website here. And they provide guidance around airflow, which would mean that it would be ideal to adjust or set an HVAC ventilation system for no recirculation of air. However, this is not why we have ventilation systems. So this suggests that a recent study examining what airflow would look like in a classroom suggests that reducing carbon dioxide emissions to 100 um, ppms or less would seems to be a, a safer level in terms of recirculating the air and filtering out. So thinking about HEPA filters in our air ventilation systems, thinking about the am amount of in parts per million of, of carbon dioxide that is in the air, and really, in reality, if theaters are going to reopen fully, you know, while SARS-CoV-2 is still an important consideration, professional ventilation engineers should be in the theater thinking about um, what that theater's ventilation system looks like and how it might need to be modified with HEPA filters and other strategies um, to maximize the air exchange and therefore minimize the, the amount of time that SARS-CoV-2 is in the air. And that gets back to the likelihood of infection equals the amount of SARS-CoV-2 times the time that one is exposed to SARS-CoV-2. So if we can increase air exchange and filter out particles, we're decreasing viral load and we're decreasing the amount of time that people are exposed to the virus. So what about the orchestra? So we can't have musical theater without music. And so I think we need to think about um, our orchestral friends. So here is the clock orchestra pit. Uh, for Beauty and the Beast several years back, and everyone looks very happy, and clearly this was pre-SARS, none of us have masks, and there's maybe, as anyone who has seen the clock pit, and certainly people who have been in the clock pit know, there's less, sometimes less than a foot in between individual players. So this situation cannot happen safely um, during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So let's look at instruments. This same Schlieren test was done um, for a clarinet. And I'll try and talk you through this. So here you can see out of the clarinet is bell. You see the aerosols being shot into the air. Now, the same thing is comes out of the keys. You can see the increase in airflow from each of these keys of the clarinet. So you need to consider not only the bell, but you need to consider every opening in a wind instrument. Now, if we move a little bit further, let's see what happens when we put a bag over the clarinet. And if you look down here by the bell, there is a little bit but generally very little um, aerosols that make their way into the air. So bags, appropriate bags, appropriate masks for instruments have been proposed as one way to limit the spread for wind instruments. I think string instruments, it's easier to mask a string player given that they are not using their breath um, to generate the sound of the instrument. I think what we worry about are wind and brass instruments where large amounts of breath are going into a smaller instrument and being shot forward out of the bell of the instrument. One thing that has been suggested for wind instruments is basically wearing an appropriately fitting mask and cutting a slit in the, uh, in the mask where the mouthpiece can go into the mouth, but the rest of the nose and the mouth are protected. Here you can see uh, the example of the bag, the wire-rimmed bag, uh, 
that the clarinet goes into with hand, you know, with, with holes for the hands to be able to fit in. There have been several um, companies that have started to make these uh, sorts of uh, bags and masks for the instruments. The bottom line is, is that anything is better than nothing, as that Schlieren test told us. So um, wind and brass instrumentalists are going to have to think about how to cover their bells uh, and cover their keyholes um, as they are playing, if we were to want to play in this SARS-CoV-2 environment. Understanding that the sound gets altered by any fabric that's being placed over the instrument. And so there's a trade-off. The beauty of sound, the quality of sound will be affected if we were to put these coverings over um, our instruments. So here's an example of the clarinet looking at the concentrations. And you can see when you measure near the bell, here is scale, scales near the bell. Here is when it's measured near the keys. Here's playing near the bell. And then here's playing if you put pantyhose over the bell. Playing with a bell cover, again, playing with near the bell, playing near the keys, and playing near in the bag. And you can see that when the clarinetist is playing in the bag, that the exhaled aerosols become substantially less, almost equal to sitting and breathing. So the th concept that, that this group is proposing is mask the person and mask the instrument. So the person should have a well-fitting multi-layer, at least two layers, three layers is ideal mask that is washable or disposable, that is tight fitting. And then the instrument should also have a multi-layered mask that, is, that can be made of either this MERV-13 type of material, which is a type of material that absorbs these aerosols, a surgical mask type material, something that's not stretchy, but something is better than nothing. Is the, is the concept here. And just to give you an idea, the median particle size for singing is 1.3 microns. A clarinet generates 0.9 micron um, uh, sized aerosols, uh, particles. And the coronavirus is measured at 0.1 microns. So whether we're singing or playing the clarinet, we are, ex we are, we are putting out into the air droplets that can have the potential to have multiple coronavirus particles within them. Some general principles is there's more particle emissions near the bell of wind instruments and that bell cover should be used as we talked about. And that generally the particle emissions are comparable between all the wind instruments and singing and acting with the exception of oboe, which because of the pressure seems to put more particles out to the air. And from a theatrical performance perspective, projecting the voice produces many more particles than regular talking and generally look like an instrument and singing when you're projecting your voice, um, which also can bring in uh, the, this concept of potentially uh, thinking about effective miking uh, as a way of, of decreasing the need for actors to have to project as much to limit the amount of aerosols that they're putting out to the air. So. Masks, we talked about distance. Generally, the musicians are gonna to have to be in a six by six foot area where there's six feet clearance all around, with the exception of trombone with the longer bell, which needs a six by nine foot area. And that applies whether you're indoors or you're outdoors. Timing, so generally the recommendation from this group is a 30 minute rehearsal and that the room should then be cleared for at least one air exchange um, within, the, within the HVAC system. Uh, before starting rehearsal again. For airflow, outdoors is best, HEPA filtration, and then air circulation rates. And the recommendation is generally about three circulations of air, full circulations of air within a room within an hour to maximize clearance of viral particles. And then certainly hygiene. Brass instruments have spit valves. Spit should not be um, extruded onto the floor. It should be extruded onto absorbent pads that are then um, discarded immediately after the rehearsal. Hand wa frequent hand washing um, and appropriate hygiene and, and sanitation of storage areas. So, so these practical considerations come out of this. You know, we should be we wearing well-fitted masks before entry into the rehearsal space. Conductors who are talking a lot must wear a mask that is tight-fitting, um, and and conductors should really consider even a portable amplifier to minimize the projection of voice, particularly in a large concert hall during a rehearsal.
all necessary talking should occur at a low conversational volume where we are decreasing the risk of putting particles far out into the air. Into the air. We talked about the six by six area for instrumentalists and six by nine by trombonists, bell covers, outdoors better than indoors, ventilation and rehearsal time. So what about the crews? When we think about crew spaces, um, oftentimes the shops are um, dirty, messy, and sometimes also in very uh, tight areas. So universal masking whenever possible should be the mandate for um, working in the shops. Social distancing, physical distancing is sometimes very hard to do uh, in the work of um, you know, building a set. And so, but, but attention should be paid when possible to be distanced. So, uh, you know, in a costume shop, stitcher should be a minimum of, of six feet apart. Disinfectant sprays, these have been used by professional companies uh, to disinfect costumes, to disinfect surfaces, dis disinfect equipment. There should be sanita sanitizing stations with hand sanitizer, soap and water, av freely available in all shops and backstage areas. There should be guidance as to limiting entrance and exits to shops and backstage. So generally, it should be one way to avoid crowds having to squeeze into tight areas. Oftentimes, this is very hard uh, in many theaters. And so limiting access to tight spaces is really important as crews do their work and, and in the backstage area um, and the scenic and costume shops. So this COVID-19 theater think tank put out disinfection guidance that says, you know, we should be cleaning and disinfecting high touch, high traffic areas with proper use of disinfectant, an appropriate product, an appropriate drying time on surfaces. This is very important. If you wipe even with a proper wipe and then you immediately touch that surface, that you have, we have not given enough time for the disinfectant to dissolve that lipid bilayer and therefore you are not getting the effects of that sanitation. You need to wipe dry and then follow the instructions about drying time before you touch surfaces. And we need to think about effects on fabrics and, and other surfaces as well. There is something called hypochlorous acid that is non-toxic, non-hazardous, and non-irritant. That may be useful for high volume areas uh, in the theater when people are in the building. So finally, we've talked about the actors, we've talked about the musicians, we've talked about the crews. Let's talk about the audience. Um, we can't have theater effectively without the audience. And so here are some of the considerations for the audience. Universal masking, that goes, I've been saying it the whole talk, you, we've all been hearing it, that is critical. Sanitizing stations at every entrance and exit to the theater. Temperature checks, I think are being recommended, but I put a question mark there because I, I think that we don't yet know the efficacy of temperature checks here. I think that temperature checks are useful to detect actively sick um, individuals who are showing symptoms, but they are not useful at picking up asymptomatic individuals. And we know that 40 to 50% of COVID-19 uh, is spread uh, through asymptomatic individuals or pre-symptomatic individuals, individuals who have not yet shown symptoms, but may in two to three days. Um, there should be pre-show surveys that ask about contact with folks with COVID-19, symptoms of COVID-19, travel information, and also contact information. And these should be required for every audience member to complete such that if an audience member reports a positive test, every person in that theater can rapidly be reached out to um, and contact, appropriate contact tracing, as we talked about earlier in the talk, can, can occur. Distancing, I'll show you some pictures. Several theaters have, have, have um, tried to employ physical distancing by removing seats or separating audience members, but uh, clearly this needs to be considered. Contact tracing, we talked about controlling the flow of audience traffic. It should be very clear where the audience is coming in and where the audience is coming out, and one-way flow of traffic should be should occur whenever possible. Generally, we should avoid refreshments um, and we should avoid intermissions where there is tight congregation of individuals in very tight spaces. So this is an example of a theater reopening plan, uh, the Alliance Theater that I thought was very um, thoughtful. And you know they state the health and safety is a top priority and before we can take the stage, proper safety protocols must be in place. And so phase one is just the staff returning to the offices. Phase two is that the artists are able to 
work on productions and we will talk about actors equities recommendations for a safe working environment and then finally patrons are welcome back to the alliance theater and then that involves mobile ticketing hand sanitizing masks staggered entry times and then strategic seating so i think let's talk about returning to the theater and i think that this is a long unknown process it will happen but how quickly it will happen is yet to be seen and i think any decisions about this need to be made with public health and safety in mind. So this is a picture of the Berliner Ensemble Theater in Berlin um, in the pre-COVID days. And this theater was one of the first to try to experiment with what theater would look like in the COVID or soon after COVID days. And they removed seats such that this theater started to look like this, which effectively removed seats to allow that's six feet distancing between individuals or, or between parties of two. Um, similarly, recently, Andrew Lloyd Webber um, had an event at the Palladium in London, uh, a venue that seats thousands. And you can see the X's on the seats and the masks where folks are sitting. And the first row was totally blocked off. And that theater that, sit, that seats thousands, uh, they allowed about 500 um, spectators in for this performance. And he called it sad and a misery for performers. I think that much of theater is the, res the audience response and it's that relationship between the actors and the audience. And if you lose that, that relationship, it becomes very hard for the actors to be able to perform effectively. So you imagine um, performing a comedy where you're relying on those laugh lines, you're relying on that feedback from the audience, and you get a few laughs in a half empty house um, because we have to physically distance. And this is something that we have to make decisions about whether this is acceptable to us um, in order to have theater in person theater happen. So Actors' Equity, in conjunction with public health professionals, put together four core principles to support safe and healthy theater productions. And these principles are that the epidemic must be under control, that individuals who may be infectious can be readily identified and isolated, that the way that we audition, rehearse, perform, and stage manage may need to change, and that efforts to control COVID-19 exposure must be collaborative. There must be collective buy-in. Everyone needs to do it. <laughs> Um, because if you don't have collective buy-in, the virus is going to continue to circulate, as I think we're seeing right now uh, in parts of our country where there is not collective buy-in and we're having spikes in cases and, um, and deaths, unfortunately. So the first principle is that the epidemic must be under control. That means that on a society-wide basis, we need extensive, highly sensitive tests that can be rapidly deployed at the beginning of any production. So a company coming together for the first time, everyone should be tested and confirmed, you know, within the within, you know, 24 to 48 hours of the first rehearsal that everyone is negative. And then there needs to be the ability to test regularly, especially if symptoms come out. And those tests need to be reliable, accurate, and fast. Same thing for the audiences. There needs to be few new cases. So, so many of us have now heard of the case positivity rate. And the case positivity rate is critical to being able to open up society again. And so, you know, a case positivity rate of 1%, which is where New York City has been um, in, over the last month, I, I, I'm, I haven't checked over the last couple of weeks to see what it's doing, is different than 5%, which is where Chicago is, which is different than 20%, which is where some of the southern states are. And decisions about opening up society, schools, mass gatherings, and that really is inclusive of theater, has to be based on the local epidemiology. So what is the case um, positivity rate for that area? Because if the case positivity rate is extremely low, with appropriate um, masking and distancing and sanitizing, the chance of a widespread transmission is lower. The minute that that case positivity rate starts to go up, 
there needs to be effective ways to be able to shut things down until that, that positivity rate comes down into a safer uh, level. And that gets to this next concept is things need to be very fluid. We need to be flexible. We need to act on the data and we need to act on the science and we need to be able to do it quickly. Comprehensive contact tracing we've already, we've already talked about. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether one can be reinfected with SARS-CoV-2 after being infected. There have been some case reports that have suggested that SARS-CoV-2 was detected uh, at a later date in individuals that were initially infected. I think that that data is pretty inconclusive right now. I think right now the thought is that the, it, the likelihood of being able to be reinfected is pretty low, but I think that this is one area where the science is really still evolving, and we need to understand the risk of reinfection and what a positive antibody test means before we can consider the epidemic under control. So the second principle is that individuals who may be infectious must be readily identified and isolated. Identify, isolate, self-quarantine. And this is going to be critical, and theater companies must be able to do this in a, in a swift, comprehensive fashion before we can um, fully reopen in the theater. So frequent, regular testing of individuals in a production. Not all infected individuals will test, test positive. The test itself is not perfect. And so we need to be aware of that. Temperature checks and symptom surveillance. So this includes doing symptom surveys every day before walking into the rehearsal room or before walking onto the stage of the theater for a performance. And that ultimately, right now, there's no easily available, highly sensitive, which means few false positives, rapid test that's available right now. And so testing needs to evolve uh, in order for us to feel like we can readily identify, isolate, and quarantine um, individuals who are infectious. The third principle, Venues and productions must be modified to minimize exposure. So even with outstanding testing and outstanding contact tracing, we are not going to be able to eliminate transmission. In the near future, it will never be a zero probability chance of transmission and infection, never. And so this is why we need to really be talking about minimizing exposure. So we need to think about how auditions and rehearsals and performances are conducted. We need to do frequent screening. We need to have replacements, understudies ready who can step in at very short notice if we're gonna to want to be able to sustain this. Because if not, then productions are gonna to have to be shut down you know, for 14 days until those individuals test negative and are clear um, to come back in. There needs to be physical modifications to the dressing rooms, which are often very tight. Shops, the audience, the orchestra pit, thinking about how many people can fit into a tight space. And we all, we've already talked about ventilation systems and airflow. And then finally, efforts to control COVID-19 exposure must be collaborative. Everyone is responsible. Everyone must participate in an infection control plan. The plans need to be specific to the production, to that cast, to that venue in that city. Um, and, and every production before being mounted needs to have a pre-production plan and then a peri-production plan and a post-production plan. Everyone must agree to abide by the rules and be part of, of the process of improving those plans. And we need to start developing those plans now if we're going to want to get back into the theater anytime um, soon. So Actors Equity has, has put together a pre-production COVID-19 safety sheet that uh, allows uh, individual companies to assess readiness uh, to be back in the theater. So does the employer state have reopening plans for theatrical productions? Will the employer be following the COVID-19 testing guidelines under the Actors Equity contracts? And frankly, this should be not only for Actors Equity, this should be for all actors. Um, we're talking about the safety of human beings and, and an employer needs to be able to, or a company needs to be willing to follow testing guidelines. Will the employer have health and safety protocols in place? Venue, housing, transportation have protocols in place. Will the employer engage a health and safety expert to coordinate COVID-19 related issues? This is really important that someone is following the science and following the guidelines and that that public health official, that health and safety expert have a definitive voice in, um, in helping companies work through this. Does, does the employer plan to exempt actors and stage managers from pre performing any additional duties? Is the production rehearsing and performing outdoors? Intermission? Will the actors wear masks or face shields during the performance? Um, likely, 
that is going to be, we talked about masks and distancing earlier, but we're going to have to think about how we alter productions and masks or face shields may have to become part of costuming um, to allow for performances to happen. Will the production direct actors to social distance in their staging and choreography? You know, um, will the production be a musical? Because then there's got to be um, guidance around singing and guidance around the orchestra. Is the production limiting each actor to one costume, wig, hair, and makeup application? So the, the days of quick changes in a very tight space with multiple costumes and aerosols flying around, I think are, are over until this thing gets under control. And is this production restricting the use of set pieces, props, smoking, vaping, special effects, complex production elements? I think we're gonna have to rethink theater to go back to sort of simplicity and away from these overly complex um, production elements in order to keep our uh, actors and audiences safe. So many of you likely know this, but uh, in South Korea, in Seoul, Phantom of the Opera, the Phantom World Tour, um, continued uh, to perform in the midst of COVID-19. And actually, um, a clock alum, uh, Matt Lisey, is uh, in this company as Raul. And what this company did was they, for the actors, had frequent tests and surveillance. Um, there was a period where one actor tested positive. They quarantined, they shut the show down for 14 days, quarantined everyone and then retested them and opened the show back up again. Uh, audiences, they have to use mobile tickling, ticketing. They get sprayed with a disinfectant mist as they walk in the door. There's staggered entry and exit times, universal masking, um, appropriate distancing. All of these things are, are in effect. The costumes are sprayed down with disinfectant spray. Um, so this is one example of how one production um, managed to survive the pandemic. Now, um, South Korea is a place where universal masking is a lot more culturally um, ingrained, and therefore it's adhered to uh, in a stricter way. And so I think when we think about how theater is going to survive, we have to think about how strictly our audiences and our actors and our um, crews and our musicians and our administrations are willing to adhere to these safety protocols. So what happened in, um, what happened in um, South Korea with Phantom of the Opera may not be generalizable. So I'd be remiss if we didn't talk through this talk about the economic impact um, of this on theaters. This has been devastating for the theater industry. And in my own hometown of Chicago, um, theaters have been having a really hard time. So some theaters have um, gone to digital content. And so this is an example, consider Theater Wit, which is just five minutes from me, where Teenage Dick went out live online in April, the same week it was slated to open. The stream brought in about $27,000, but the traditional show would generate about $55,000. And so once the shutdown happened, the theater started to lose $7,500 a week. They had to stop paying rent. Their PPP loan covered staff, but then they were furloughing all staff, including the artistic director. Uh, and so theaters are losing money big time. So how we support our theaters, our artists, is critical if we want this to be sustained um, in the future. And you know, Theater Wit is a small theater. Um, the, the, this is actually about, um, sorry about this, this is about uh, Steppenwolf, which is a, a major, major regional theater in Chicago. Um, Gary Sinise uh, um, and others uh, you know, are, are, are founding members of this theater. They have had to furlough and they are thinking about what their season is going to look like next year with contingency plans in place. So this is really hitting the theater community hard. Smaller theaters are being hit harder simply because they really can't afford to stay open if they are not um, if they're not up and running. So um, the last thing is is that that there was this great that I found this great uh, article in the Los Angeles Times about reopening theater. Uh, Twenty five theater professionals sort of talking about what post pandemic theater looks like, and I thought it was worth reading some of them. So here, Luis Alfaro, who's a playwright, 
said, I'm most excited about a post-pandemic theater that embraces its literal beginnings to find itself, sound and movement, an actor and language, story and space, a deck, a chair, a performer. I would love to see our re-entry, a symbol of our ability to recover. And the theater community is a community that recovers, rely on simple virtuosity of the actor telling our stories. Um, so again, going back to simplicity, smaller casts, storytelling, not complicated costumes, not complicated sets, um, an actor telling, telling their story. Patty Lapone says, I don't know how art will change. Maybe it will be joyful because we're back in the theaters. Maybe playwrights will write hilarious comedy. What I do know is if we return to our beloved stages, they must be cleaned, sanitized, and fumigated. More often than not, when theaters are renovated, the backstage, dressing rooms, fly floors, and the alleys are neglected. We work in perpetually filthy environments. It's essentially a Petri dish. It's time theater owners take a hose and cleaning fluids to our workspace. In fact, the workforce backstage and the audience out front will be safer, and that's what we need. Emily Mann, who is the uh, outgoing artistic director of McCarter Theater, says, first of all, I do not believe we are ever going back to normal, if that means returning to making theater the way we did before the pandemic. I'm exhilarated by the forced reset. It demands asking the essential question, is theater necessary? Just as we did in the 60s and 70s, we will have to strip down what is fundamental to making great theater. And some of the most important work of the 20th century came out of this movement. Plagues have closed theaters before and they reopen often stronger than before. I'm excited to see what our future brings. And I think that's important to realize. Right now, the end does not seem in sight, but there will be an end to this pandemic and theater will return. Sorry. There we go. So here's some general considerations to end with. Nothing is risk-free. We have to be informed, flexible, and willing to change. Outside is better than inside. We need to think about ventilation and airflow in our spaces. We need to think about shorter exposure times. It means maybe shortening rehearsals or shortening uh, the time that an audience is in the theater. S smaller groups, so probably the initial, um, the initial shows to do on your way back is not going to be Hello, Dolly. It might be um, last five years when you think about uh, the actors on stage, masking people and instruments, cleaning and disinfection, distancing, both in the way that we audition, the way that we rehearse, the way that we perform, the way shows are staged, and the way that audiences enjoy theater. We need to be cognizant of our individual health risks. So if we have a comorbidity that puts us at higher risk of more severe illness with COVID-19, obesity, diabetes, asthma, we need to be um, even more vigilant about our exposure levels, contact tracing, testing, and ultimately vaccination. So to summarize, the COVID-19 pandemic has really obliterated the theater industry. It's an industry that's produced, we're producing um, an art form that really relies on community, close contact, and intimacy. But just because it's obliterated doesn't mean that it's not going to come back and doesn't mean that there's not the will to bring it back. And bringing theater back requires very careful consideration to public health concerns local epidemiology, case spread, case positivity rate, safe practices by actors, musicians, crews, and audiences, and a robust infrastructure to test and manage cases when they occur. And I do say when they occur, not if they occur, because they will occur. Theaters need to collaborate closely with public health experts to ensure the safety of everyone. There is not going to be a return to normal for a long time. Theater will have to go through a period where it reinvents itself. But the theater has always been a place of exponential creativity, passion, community, diversity, and connection. Artists and administrators should leverage those strengths as they plan the evolution of theaters in the coming years. And ultimately, we will get through this. The theater community is a strong one. It is a diverse one, and it is a creative one. And ultimately, we will, we will, um, we will survive this and um, theater will survive this. It just is going to require uh, a lot of work uh, and a lot of creativity as we reinvent ourselves. Ultimately, big theater, the way the return to normal, I think is going to be impossible until we have vaccination, which would allow the herd immunity rates to um, reach higher levels. But that doesn't mean that in the interim, there can't be smaller experiments that are very well controlled and very. Um, tightly monitored um, in conjunction with regulations and public health uh, guidance um, to allow theater to move forward in the interim until we reach that time.
I want to thank you for your attention, and I think there will be some question and answers um, to follow. On the Clock is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, please visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Tune in again next week for another lecture in our series, On the Clock.